Hello and welcome to the Mindful Coach Podcast. I'm your host, Brett Hill, a mindful somatic coach and founder of the Mindful Coach Association. I meet a lot of coaches in my work and the stories of the members of the Mindful Coach Association is so inspiring that I decided to start this podcast so you can hear them firsthand. Plus, you'll meet the masters of their craft and coaching and coach training, and you'll hear about new technology that can help you and your clients. And so you can have the successful practice that you deserve. You'll be hearing from experts in conscious marketing, as well as vetted service providers to help us grow our business. Because I'm on a mission to help coaches and other helping professionals who are aligned with mindfulness to be the very best we can be so we can do the important and challenging work we are called to do. If this resonates with you, join your colleagues at MindfulCoachAssociation.com and sign up for a free community membership. And now, the Mindful Coach Podcast. Hello and welcome to the Mindful Coach Podcast. I'm beyond thrilled to welcome to the show Alex Conway. Now, I, I have to say a little bit about how I got inspired to, to invite Alex to join the show because um, we were meeting in the Mindful Coaches Corner and he was talking about the work that he was doing and I thought, oh my God, we've got to talk to him on the podcast. So here we are. So just so you know, uh, Alex is the author, activist and founder of LBGTQ Joy. He's a graduate of Brown University and spent the last decade working as a clinical psychologist. Now he specializes in coaching for those who've been stigmatized for who or how they love and so that they can feel seen, connected, and inspired to be the best versions of themselves. So welcome to the show, Alex. Thank you so much for having me. It's such a pleasure. Oh, well, I, I can't can't wait to hear about this. So it's like... And, and, <laughs> It was kind of odd because whenever we were in the meeting and you were talking about, you know, the work that you're bringing into your community, I just felt such a resonance somehow. And I thought, you know, I just want to hear about the work that you're doing and, um, you know, and how you got inspired to do this work. And uh, obviously there's a tremendous need for for help in, in this community. And so I just want to tell us a little bit about what led up to you. I mean, you, you, you've got, you said two degrees. I mean, what inspired you to like, you just really charge in like that and, and go for it with uh, the academic side and become a clinical psychologist? Yes, absolutely. So I've always been motivated to help others, and I didn't quite know what that was going to look like. So mm -hmm. at first, I was really passionate about the body, and I wanted to know everything there was. I wanted to be a doctor. And so I studied human biology at Brown University. And while I was taking those classes, I was also studying psychology, and I fell in love with the mind. I just fell in love with understanding humans and understanding who we are, what connects us, what inspires us. Mm -hmm. And so after school, I started off with activism. I was with the Trevor Project. I was with the ACLU in Michigan and their LGBTQ project and worked on the Supreme Court case that was recently seen for transgender oh, wow. rights last year. So I was a member of that team in the very initial stages, uh, but getting my feet wet with activism. And I realized that I wanted to learn more skills so that I could have a better impact and help others. The mm -hmm. stories I was hearing on Trevor Project about LGBTQ plus youth who were experiencing suicidal thoughts or child abuse and neglect at home broke my heart and I knew that I had to do more. So I went to grad school and I started studying cl clinical psychology. Mm. Uh, and I was there for many years and a lot of the studies and a lot of the theories were really helpful, but I felt they were missing something. A lot yeah. of the studies were designed by white cisgender men yeah. for white cisgender men. Mm -hmm. And there was a huge lack of emphasis on diversity and a lack of understanding of different perspectives. Mm -hmm. And so for my research project, I wanted to go dig, I wanted to dig a little bit deeper and get a better understanding of human nature. Instead of just looking at Western psychology, I wanted to also include some concepts from Eastern philosophy. Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. And I wanted to focus on what unites us and what is the impact of having a hidden stigma. And so what is a hidden stigma? Mm-hmm. Almost anything that we feel a sense of shame around can be a source of hidden stigma, such as sexual orientation, gender identity, or even mental health in general. So we're all walking around carrying these aspects of our identity that are important to us, that are hidden, and that have a massive impact. And so my research looked at what is the overall impact of having one of these hidden stigmas on our sense of identity. And in order to answer that question, I wanted to look at all of the knowledge available. So I liked a lot of the evidence-based theories from Western psychology of how do we develop, how do our thoughts influence our behavior, what do we need to develop. And so in Western psychology, there's one school of thought that's called Mm self-psychology. And this is the idea that we have three core needs. And if we have these needs met, we have the tools necessary to thrive. And those three needs are to be seen, connected, and inspired. Mm. Or what makes us unique? What makes us different? So, for example, I see you as a non-binary, disabled, trans woman of color. I understand your differences. I understand those aspects that make you unique. You feel seen. The second is you're connected with people who have a similar sense of shared belonging, whether it's um, co-workers or teammates or individuals in the same tribe, you feel seen, you feel like you belong to a sense of community and that gives you a sense of shared belonging. And the last is to feel inspired to become something better than what you're at now. Mm -hmm. So a coach, a mentor, a teacher, a role model, somebody who has that same shared identity that can inspire you to become better. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to take upon this knowledge and use some of the concepts from Eastern philosophy. So specifically the idea of yin and yang, the idea that we have these two opposing sides of us that are actually in a sense of balance and are connected. So instead of viewing it as black versus white, what is the commonality? What unites us? And the second is the idea from Buddhism, the idea of enlightenment. So enlightenment is an ordinary state of being where you're living authentically in the moment with compassion. So authentically is very similar to self-psychology. How do we discover authentic self? How do we have those core needs met? Living in the moment is all about mindfulness and living with compassion. Mm -hmm. And compassion has been shown to be a better, more stable measurement of our sense of well-being, our sense of happiness, than self-esteem. For those of you who don't know the difference, self-esteem is how you feel good about yourself by comparison to other people. Mm -hmm. So when I compare myself to others, I'm above average, I feel great, or I'm not as good as everybody else and I feel bad. Mm -hmm. And there's nothing wrong with this, especially if you happen to be good with many things, but it sets people up to be unhappy because it's not possible for us always to be above average in everything. Mm -hmm. Now, self-compassion recognizes our shared common humanity, recognizes that these aspects are all part of the shared lived experiences. And by being kind to ourselves and being compassionate to ourselves, we can really uplift and celebrate who we are, and that can have a massive impact on our overall sense of happiness and well-being. Mm. And so my research looked at all of these concepts and looked at what happens when we have these needs met and what happens when we do not have these needs met. 
specifically for the LGBTQ plus community. And the research shows that this community, along with individuals who are of color or of any other minority status, have a much higher likelihood of not having these needs met. Mm -hmm. And as a result, they have a much higher tendency to have things like substance use disorder, risky sexual behaviors, uh, increased eating disorders or body image issues. And so a lot of this stems from not having these needs met. And as an antidote, taking the time to help individuals develop these needs, even if it's later on in life, has been shown to increase our sense of happiness and well-being. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, there's an emerging field of positive psychology that looks at how do we help increase these traits that we know to be helpful, such as gratitude, mm -hmm. such as compassion, such as taking an activity that we enjoy and slowing it down and prolonging it and savoring it to increase the joy in our lives. Mm -hmm. And so after many years in the field, I've worked with everything. I've uh, worked in rural settings. I've worked in urban, urban settings. I've worked with CEOs. I've worked with children with emotional and behavioral difficulties. I've worked with immigrants with forensic issues and conducted psychological assessments. And throughout all of this training, I realized that the field of psychology, although has many strengths and is able to produce a lot of change, also has a lot of setbacks mm -hmm. in terms of how you can administer that treatment um, needing to come up with a diagnosis and come up with what is wrong with the individual before you can help. And as a result, I launched my own private practice in the coaching industry so that I can take all of these skills and help a larger audience, help individuals outside of my own city, outside of my state, outside of my country, anywhere that there's a need Anywhere that there's an individual who feels lost, who feels misunderstood, who feels like they do not belong, I want them to know that they have a place, they have somebody they can come to, they can be open about whatever their pain is, and at the same time, learn some concrete skills to increase joy and happiness in their day-to-day -day lives. Mm. Wow. Wow. So that's lbgtqjoy.com? Yeah. That's correct. Beautiful. Wow, that's quite that's quite a, a, a big one. Um, so what is it that kind of caused you to, to, you know, I mean, starting off with ACLU and the embracing the whole academic side of it and bringing in, I mean, there's, there's a lot going on there in terms of like really trying to get the big picture and to make this like real like how do how do you fill in the gaps from what's missing and make this actually applicable to the community that you're actually trying to serve versus the way th this was generated and feel, feeling the gap there and then taking action to go well this can be fitted with these other philosophies that seem to, to elevate the the entire conversation i'm 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 reframing a lot of your conversation here. I hope that's okay with you. That's okay. Um, and I'm just wondering, though, like, what is it in you that before you even set out that you said, I'm, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to be an activist. Like, what, how did that fire get lit in you? Yeah. So being somebody who's also a member of the LGBTQ plus community, I know firsthand what it's like to have my differences be viewed as negative. Mm -hmm. I am somebody who also has dyslexia and ADHD. And so very familiar with the idea of these hidden stigmas mm -hmm. and had a lot of experience being teased and bullied for those differences. And I wanted to make sure that every person who came after me knew that those differences are not something to be ashamed of, but there's something to be proud of. 
They are something that helps define who you are. And that is something that is beautiful. Mm -hmm. And by learning to look at the idea of difference more objectively, more through that lens of mindfulness and say, this is not something that is wrong. In fact, this is something that should be celebrated. Let's learn the skills and the techniques to help elevate that, to help individuals who feel like they do not belong, realize that they do, realize that they are connected. We have 8 billion people on this planet. So no matter who you are, no matter what you feel internally, there are so many people who have had that same or very similar sense of struggle. Mm -hmm. And along this journey, working with so many different types of individuals really helped to solidify that. Mm. At the end of the day, I was working with individuals who had so much less, who did not have supportive parents, who did not feel seen at home, who were afraid to even ask for help due to the immigration status and had all of this fear. And in some small way, able to address that and help provide a space where they were safe to just be themselves, to just explore and connect with somebody else, and to start to develop the ability to be compassionate to themselves. Because these things, although, you know, we made it it sound easy, it's really a lot of work and takes a lot of effort. Mm But the more in which you invest in it, the more you start to see those results and the more you start to realize how deeply we're all connected. Mm -hmm. And I use that as my motivation each day to to try and be better for myself and for my community. So how do you help people who come to you and they're, you know, they're feeling oppressed and, you know, like they don't fit and they're ashamed and, and, and you're, you've got, this vision of how we're all connected, how do you help someone wire that up in a way where they don't just immediately get connected to the negative side of what they're experiencing? Because you can imagine someone might be hearing this and going, well, if I start to get connected, what I experience is, is that people are actually oppressing me. How do you, how do you kind of work that piece so that they connect up differently? Yeah, by recognizing both, by recognizing that, yes, part of life is pain. I've experienced it. I've experienced bullying. I've experienced trauma. I've watched others who've experienced it. This is a part of life. And this, although sad, is a part of that shared human experience. And so when we experience these things, bringing it back to that idea of yin and yang and how these things are connected, it gives us a deeper picture of who we are. Mm -hmm. Instead of just being one-sided, it's just joy, it's just happiness, it's just light, realizing that both are actually connected. And so when we experience pain, it's an opportunity for us to be stronger. It's an opportunity for us to experience strength and resiliency as well. And allowing yourself the opportunity to feel both as it is. So one technique I've taught to many, many clients is the one to 10 technique. Mm. Think about whatever you're feeling, whether it's pain, whether it's sadness, whether it's joy, whatever the feeling is, all of our feelings are equally valid. How intensely am I feeling it? Mm. On a scale from one to 10, allow myself the opportunity to just feel that emotion. So when I was in the school and I was working with some of my children, one came up to me and said that they were feeling sad. And I was like, okay, why are you feeling sad? And they were feeling sad because their father was shot over a parking spot dispute. Mm -hmm. And just how unimaginably painful it must have been. So we just sat there and just for 10 seconds allowed him to feel that sadness, allowed him to cry, allowed him to express it in whatever way 
he felt was necessary. Like shot like dead? No, he ended up living, but he was sent to the hospital. Still um, a big deal. Very big still deal. a big deal yeah. over a parking spot dispute and never having imagined that, never having lived through that. Right. The world is not safe in, in, in a real way for all of a sudden to this child, you know? Right. Yeah. And so to allow ourselves those 10 seconds to just feel that. Afterwards, asked how he felt. And just that act brought it down to a seven. Mm -hmm. We repeated the exercise again and again and again until he was ready to go to class. Next, I had to bring myself back up to get ready for the next client. So mm -hmm. allowing ourselves those moments allows us to recognize what's happening. And at the same time, on the way home, taking an extra moment to appreciate at the time I was in DC and we had, it was fall, so the leaves were changing. And so taking an extra eight seconds to pause, reflect upon the beauty of the trees and really soak mm -hmm. that in. And so we're not denying the sadness, we're not running away from it. In fact, we're using tools like mindfulness to non-judgmentally accept where we're at and then allow it to be a moment and then move on to the next Do moment. you actually um, frame your work with your clients as mindfulness or do you just give techniques that are mindful in their nature? Uh, I'm just curious about it because some coaches that I work with, they... they um, they have trouble if they use the word mindfulness at all, you know, because there's a lot of stuff around it. So I'm just curious your approach. Yes. So it's really interesting because there is a lot of stigma around the idea of mindfulness, the idea of spirituality, all these concepts. And at the same time, they can be really helpful. So I will oftentimes introduce them as mindfulness, give a little bit of background about why we're doing it, and more importantly, what mindfulness is. Because mm -hmm. a lot of people use the term mindfulness incorrectly mm -hmm. these days. Mindfulness is, has two main components. The first one is to be present, and the second one is to be without judgment. So to say you're going to be mindfully happy Although it's a great idea, adding that happiness is adding a judgment mm -hmm. and that is getting away happy. from the core of what <laughs> mindfulness is. Mm -hmm. And so the more that we really get at and understand what this is, we can be helpful in how to apply it. And so giving individuals multiple ways of doing it. A lot of people also say, confuse mindfulness with meditation. Mm -hmm. And while meditation is a wonderful tool to practice mindfulness, it's not the only tool. Mm -hmm. Specifically for individuals who are maybe more neurodivergent and have a hard time with sitting still and breathing, and they yeah. say, oh, I can't sit still, therefore I can't do mindfulness. For them, I like to remind them that they actually have five senses. <laughs> what they see, what they touch, what they smell, what they taste, what they hear. And so those are five opportunities to practice mindfulness. Mm -hmm. Whether it's listening to a song and just being present with the music, whether it's eating a sandwich, whether it's going and smelling a candle or taking a walk, there are so many different ways mm -hmm. and finding which way works best for each individual can be really helpful. So instead of saying you must breathe for three minutes a day right, right. and you must do X, Y, and Z, although it has good intentions and although it comes from a good place, if that individual has been traumatized, can actually produce more harm than good. Mm -hmm. So knowing how to use these tools and when to use these tools is so important. That's really solid advice, I think. And it's like 
um, you were saying driving down the road and noticing the trees and the color of the trees and letting yourself be present for that, that's straight up mindfulness and just letting yourself have that moment. And I love that. I use those kinds of techniques in my own practice. So um, that's really powerful stuff. In your community, what kind of, um, so what's your, your, is your focus primarily right now? Because you've done a lot of things, you know, with the children and the neurodivergence. Is it still that, that big scope or is it more focused these days? So, yeah. So right now I am here to help anybody who needs help. Okay. And due to the overwhelming <laughs> lack of support and lack of visibility, I want to make sure that those who are at the metaphoric bottom mm-hmm. are lifted up as well. Beautiful. By lifting those who are at the bottom, we take everybody who is above them as well and lifts everybody up. Yeah. And so that's why I created the site specifically targeted towards those who have been overlooked or who have been misunderstood so they know that they have a space. but. All of my experience in past decade has been with everybody. So by doing that allows me to work with whatever the actual issue is and get to what the core is. Mm-hmm. Well, I think uh, it's great that you have uh, uh, the neurodivergent piece as well, because so many people I find I have some slice of that, if not a big slice of it in our culture. Um, there, it seems like we all come out with kind of maladapted neurologies these days, I guess is a way of saying it. And they're sort of like normal. That's what everybody thinks is normal in some ways. But are there some general practices that you, that you might um, use in your toolkit that you feel like are really valuable in a generalized way for a broad group of people? Yeah. So I, I, that's where I really like that concept of enlightenment. Mm. The idea of metaphorically thinking about what is your light? What are the things that bring you joy? What are the things that bring you happiness? What are the things that bring you value? What makes you connected? And so by thinking about those, helping any individual feel seen for them, helping them kind of have the tools to connect. So let's say you are an engineer, mm-hmm. you know, helping them kind of discover that and helping them feel inspired and also teaching everybody these skills around mindfulness. So how to be more present, how to let go of the past. We all have a past. <laughs> the majority of us, aspects of our past were painful. Mm-hmm. We'll all have a future. For a majority of us, there's aspects of our future that cause us to be anxious or worried or stressed that we have to get there. And so for most of us, the present can be a safe space. Now, it's important to note that this isn't for everybody, especially for those who are in active trauma. Mindfulness is not a very effective tool. It's important that you get to a safe space. I like to use the analogy with my clients that if your house is on fire, do not be practicing mindfulness. Right. Get out oh, what's of the it feel like house. to be in a house that's on fire? Right. <laughs> right. Get out of the burning house. Do not be smelling the smoke. Do not be feeling the flames <laughs> in your body. Get to safety and then practice it. So helping individuals, you know, maybe if they're in abuse or in a situation like that, don't be practicing mindfulness during activities that are causing trauma wait until you're in a safe space. But once you are in a safe space, and for the majority of us, the present can be a safe space, that is a great time to really bring yourself back to the present moment, Mm -hmm. let go of what's going on, regroup, and allow yourself to move forward. Mm -hmm. And that third piece around compassion is where a lot of people struggle. A lot Mm -hmm. of people are their own worst critics. Uh, in Western psychology, there's the idea of self-talk and negative self-talk and these ideas of negative core beliefs that I'm unlovable, that the world is unsafe, that I am somehow flawed. And so a lot of people at their core 
believe that these things are wrong and that they are somehow wrong. Mm -hmm. And so compassion in a broad sense can be a really helpful antidote to those things. Having, having compassion for that part of them that says those things to them. Having compassion for themselves, having mm -hmm. compassion for others, both for themselves mm -hmm. and for others, um, can be really, really helpful. And like that is one thing that can also be hopefully helpful to a lot of people is at its core, the brain does not really know the difference between real and imagined situations. Mm -hmm. So the act of imagining self-compassion and imagining people talking kindly to you or you speaking kindly to yourself can actually change the way the brain is wired. Mm -hmm. And so the more that we practice these skills, it's like going to the gym. The more we work out our biceps, the stronger they get. The more we activate the part of a brain that's wired for compassion, the more it grows. And so the more that we start to talk to ourselves in a kinder way, the better it can be. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just helping literally using neurological framing, wiring up the neural networks that, that do that so that they just fire more readily and easily. I'm trying to to find ways to connect to what's mm, resourceful and resilient and and good that, that is so connected to the negative that they come together. You know, like they, they, I, I want to look at the tree, but how can I? Whenever there's school shootings happening everywhere, you know, and and, and those things get so wired up together uh, that it's, uh, it becomes impossible to experience the goodness. Cause what I heard you say, just to summarize, I think is that you start with perspective and kind of like the acceptance of your whole life and then acceptance. Um, how do you help people get that perspective? That's a great question and helping them kind of realize day by day, what they can do. Help them understand at a deeper level why they might be fearing this, what they have control over, and what they don't have control over. And helping them tie it to things that are deeper, more at their core, and more stable. And specifically thinking about it in terms of how is their mind, body, and spirit connected? Mm -hmm. And what do they have control over? Right. And so yeah. if their mind is racing and they have a ton of thoughts on their mind, bringing it back to the body, yeah. what is happening physiologically and helping them understand it in relationship to that idea of yin and yang. So in our body, we have our own sense of yin and yang. It's called our nervous system, <laughs> the automatic and sympathetic nervous system. So we are hardwired physiologically to have two main ways of functioning. The first is rest, digest, relaxation. Mm -hmm. And the second is flight, fight, response. And so for that one, I like to explain it like a deer. People have a lot of compassion for animals. And so thinking about an animal can hopefully help them to realize what's happening for themselves. So thinking about what is it like when a deer experiences something threatening for the first time? The first thing they do is they freeze. As humans, we have a very similar response. We physically freeze, maybe our muscles get tight, maybe our mind goes blank there's some type of freezing response. The second thing that happens is we want to run away. So mm -hmm. we either avoid the topic, we physically escape the, the thing that's causing us to fear or afraid. We want to get away from it as fast as possible. And then the third thing is fight. So whether that's physical aggression or whether that's anger, but recognizing that all three of those go all tied to the same physiological response, which is anxiety, whether it's perceived or whether it's real. Mm -hmm. And so helping them understand when they're having all of these thoughts, what is actually happening underneath and what they can do about it. 
Mm-hmm. And that's where we use a lot of mindfulness. That's where we use a lot of breathing because breathing is tied to both. It's physiologically impossible to take a deep breath when we're in a state of anxiety. Yeah, so what, body, so what can you do? Yeah, so by recognizing, okay, I'm starting to feel tense. Okay, my mind's starting to go blank. Okay, I'm actively running away. So mm-hmm. whatever your warning signs are, recognizing those in the body, recognizing, okay, I'm starting to feel myself activate. Mm-hmm. What can I do? Slow down the breathing, Mm. slowing it down, counting to three, inhale one, two, three, exhale one, two, three, and just repeat that. And repeating it 10 times allows the individual to really come back and feel centered. Mm. Another really helpful technique if somebody is in a state of panic is a grounding technique. And so I often use the example of five, four, three, two, one. So five things you see, four things you touch, three things you can feel, two things you can taste, one thing you can smell. The order does not matter. (laughs) It does not matter how many you actually do. What matters is you start paying attention to the external environment instead of these internal thoughts. Mm-hmm. And the more that you do it, you're bringing yourself back to the present moment. Yeah, beautiful. I think it was uh, Eckhart Tolle said, you know, the body is always in the moment, right? So it's sort of like, and that's so foundational to so much in terms of mindfulness practice, spiritual practice, martial arts. It's always, you know, coming back to right now, what's here now. Yep. Yeah, beautiful. That's so powerful. Well, I'm I'm really so inspired by the work that you're doing. What's next for you? What what's uh, do you have a uh, are, are you growing as a business? You're just trying to keep keep up the good work. Do you have a what? Where's your growth? What's your excitement about the future for you? Yeah. So my growth and my excitement is right now. We're in the beginning stages of the business. So if you're listening out there, please help us grow. Please help. Sp- spread the word in any way you can. I want to make sure that those who need the most help are able to know that this resource is available to them. Um, And I look forward to it growing. I look forward to offering many types of ways for everybody to have more joy. Mm -hmm. Regardless if you're in the LGBTQ community, I think they need the most help and support to know that it's available. But we can all grow. We can all have more joy. We can all realize these parts of us are human and gain some technical skills to kind of increase the parts of our lives that are already going well. Mm -hmm. And so I look forward to offering more workshops, uh, more groups, more opportunities for everybody to feel seen. So if you're out there and you feel alone, please get in contact please let me know. There's chances are that there's other individuals who feel the same way. I would love to create a group that is customized and tailored to your needs. So if there's a need and you feel that it's not currently being addressed, I welcome that feedback so that we can help you feel seen. Mm, So great and inspiring. So by all means, you know, if you're listening to this, connect up with Alex. And uh, also you can find him on the mindfulcoachassociation.com website where he's listed there. Wow. So inspiring. And I'm really appreciative of the way you've not only moved into serving these communities, but done so in a way where you just put yourself into it so fully in terms of learning the skills and and filling in the whole a bigger framework than the things that you were actually taught so that you can serve in a better way and be an inspiration to others so thank you for that i I like to say sometimes on behalf of the world thank you so much for your work (laughs) i appreciate it all right thank you so much for taking the time to speak with me today you bet thank you very kindly And that's a wrap for this edition of the Mindful Coach Podcast. We hope you enjoyed this presentation. And if you did, follow us and leave us a review. 
If you're a coach or helping professional that values mindfulness in your work, browse over to mindfulcoachassociation.com and create a free community profile describing your services so the world can find you. And you'll be invited to exclusive community meetings where you can meet your colleague. I'm your host, Brett Hill, founder of the Mindful Coach Association, coach and coach trainer teaching the Mindful Coach Method. You can find out more about me at themindfulcoach.com. Until next time, stay present.